Explorer. I'm your producer, Todd Bartu, and this is Offshore Explorer. Offshore Explorer looks at the world from the sailor's point of view, port by port. Together, we share stories that detail the important intersections between sailing culture and life, past, present, and future. Coming up on today's episode, the reality of piracy and today's modern pirates. But first, let me introduce our host, a lifelong sailor who has traveled the world, raced international 14s, and crossed the Atlantic countless times, a published author who has written for both stage and screen, Mr. Scott Dodson. Hey, Todd, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. So what's on the slate for today's episode? Pirates, Todd, just pirates. Pirates all the time. That's what we're up to is we're going to talk about the mythos of pirates. Okay, great. Take it away, Scott. Desperation causes bad decisions, sometimes bloody ones as well. I can't recall another group of men who have been so thoroughly evil and that have been so incautiously elevated to the status of a lovable rogue as pirates. I start this whole idea on the pirate myth because I've been working on the American Mariner and the myth of the American Mariner and the iconic sense of what the American quote-unquote captain, the American hero what all of this actually means. And it's very tied up into how uh, we see ourselves and how we see ourselves as we sail and the systems on our sailboats and ships that we work with and, and the character of the captain and the leadership that the captain is, aspires to. Now, these are really kind of important uh, aspects. And I think that the American Mariner itself, although a kind of new character in the history of characters, um, is a direct descendant of the, the English ship captain with a couple of notable uh, differences. But one thing that's actually quite interesting is where the ship captain or the British ship captain has always been seen as a sort of noble and uh, disciplined character. Going back to Lord Nelson as an example um, and a variety of other captains involved in the great age of, of sailing in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, a majority of the Caribbean pirates that we know of were pretty much English. They they were descended from, um, they came from England, a lot of them. Uh, Edward Teach did, famous Blackbeard, um, Robert Sears. He was, uh, they say he was born in Jamaica, but Jamaica at the time was a um, British colony. Um, and actually some people think he was actually born in England. So there was a lot of um, influence from the English in terms of the Caribbean pirate scheme, myth, and concern of what was going on. And of course, it's the status of these guys who were quite ruthless and murderous and caught between world powers and greed and desperation and 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 somewhat and not more than somewhat but very highly skilled in sailing ships and fighting that sass has been elevated to the the lovable rogue you know the pirates of the caribbean johnny depp you know he's just he's a nice guy but you know, he rapes, pillages, and murders, but he's still a nice guy. This sort of unhinged freedom and 
freedom with a lack of consequences has permeated the American point of view of the American mariner far more than it has in any other country. And I say that um, from basically from some experience. I know that uh, many there's many famous uh, French pirates, um, and the French are, are very cautious about the skull and bones flags. Um, I've actually know of the authorities coming out in a boat and telling someone to take down their pirate flag that it is against international law and that piracy is a very very serious thing um, i've not had that in the english but the english seem a little bit more reserved in that regard and although you know our uh, beer drinking neanderthal friends who you know yelling and screaming and driving their boats fast through no wake zones and those guys you know they're always going to be that kind of character that that they think or we may associate with pirates but pirates were a little uh, more disciplined um, they were far more ruthless and um, even though you know the idea of having being drunk and having rum on board and all the rest of that kind of stuff uh, these guys these these guys would cut your throat as simple as as say how do you do and this is something that a lot of people don't realize, but if you have to kind of go back into a little bit of history to figure this out. So my experience, my personal experience with pirates has been limited, although interesting in the sense that I've been through a number of areas that have been um, more, I've been warned about pirates, for example. I spent a great deal of time in the Caribbean, and Caribbean pirates were very notorious, and even today, Caribbean pirates are very notorious. There's a very famous case um, in uh, Antigua where a family was uh, murdered on their boat while in Anchorage, and it was a result, they never caught them. It was a result of, of pirates coming to steal stuff. Now, pirates, the idea of a pirate is just somebody that is that is robbing you on the sea. They could be called bandits, um, you know, outlaws, etc. People that they're robbing you and killing you. That's what they're doing. And the history of this is is pretty cool in in one regard and um really quite really quite frightening um in another the earliest kind of documented instances of piracy were the exploits of the sea peoples um, they threatened ships sailing in the aegean and mediterranean waters uh, the, this was around the 14th century bc um, the Phoenicians were pirates, the uh, Tyrrhenians were pirates, um, a lot of ancient Greeks uh, condoned the, 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 the viable profession of being a, a pirate, um, but eventually it became regarded uh, as, a, as, as a disgrace to be a pirate. But for a long time, it was considered uh, almost honorable. Towards the end of the ninth century, um, Moorish pirate havens were established along the coast of southern France and northern Italy, and more raiders sacked um, St. Peter, St. Paul, Basilica in Rome. And in 911, the Bishop of uh, Narbonne was unable to return to France from Rome because the Moors had controlled all the passes in the Alps. So the pirates were not just, you know, on the shores, but they they ventured inside um, in the land. Um, the Balearic Islands, uh, you know, that would be Ibiza and, and those islands off the coast of Spain, um, they were havens for Arab pirates. But you have to also understand that that this 
was pirates were also part of a uh, political scheme. And the idea of the, of the Muslim world, the Ottomans, they controlled an extensive amount of the Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean, in the 15th and 16th century. Um, and they saw piracy or sea trading as as a way to kind of go about um, business. It was both a, a political tool, all right, and and it was a, it was just a, a pure economic terror. And there's quite a few things pirates do um, that are basically extensions of what the government wants. And one of these pirate groups, the Barbary pirates, kind of made famous in the, God bless his soul for just passing away, Sean Connery um, in The Lion in the Wind, which is a movie that uh, is one of the, it's, it's, it's one of the great movies because it has all the elements of a great movie, but never was really a great movie. Um, and it's one of the most enjoyable ones I found to watch, but they, the Barbary pirates controlled North African ports in Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli, and Morocco around 1500. Um, they, they preyed on the shipping, mostly uh, Christian powers. And um, they just, uh, this all sort of kept going until the 11th century, the 15th to the 11th century, to the 15th century, 16th century. And, and and really it sort of it, it sort of came up until the early 19th century in which the Barbary pirates were eventually uh, put down um, and this was because of the conquest of both the Americans and and the and, and the French who essentially took over Algeria so a lot of this piracy stuff is a sort of an extension of government terror government policy but you don't have to just stay in the mediterranean so we're big in the caribbean during the age of sail in the 16th 17th century and that didn't last very long that was only a few you know that was like less than 100 years that this piracy kind of concept existed there um, in the Mediterranean, it exist, existed for centuries. And I say that because I, I've sailed in the Caribbean and, and run into pirates to a certain extent, but they were uh, not, you know, with a bandana and a sword in their hand. They were this one guy named John. He, he was actually um, very nice. He's an English guy, and it he had a, a very beautiful uh, sailing yacht of about 90 feet, just gorgeous. And um, I was on the dock, and um, I see these two guys coming down the dock, and they're definitely just off the airplane. I was in St. Thomas in Charlotte Amalie, and um, they're walking down the dock, and they're kind of in suits with their ties askew, and... One guy is a kind of big, kind of thuggish looking guy, and the other guy is is sort of a businessman, glasses bald, you know, minimal hair on his head, I should say. And 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 they came and they and they I was cleaning my boat and they said, You know where John is, and this is my boat, and, and they get like this whole thing, like this is my boat. And I said, Geez, man, I don't know, knock on the boat, find out, if, see if he's there. Well he wasn't there. So there was this whole thing going on and they were on the dock they they left they came back and john came on the came back and he jumped on the boat he took all his mooring lines jump on the boat i said hey john this guy was he says yeah i know thanks a lot i really appreciate it and he backed the boat out and he was gone he had stolen this boat and they were tracking him on this boat he stole this boat and he took it to columbia this is piracy, okay? And he sold the boat in Colombia. He had a Colombian girlfriend, gorgeous, this beautiful, she was a beautiful woman, all right? The next time I see him is like six, seven, eight months later, something like that. I see him at anchor, and he's in a whole new boat. 
And I'm like, dude, this is a beautiful boat. We're, oh, no, I traded those boats. Those guys, they didn't. They were partners. He gave me this whole story, whatever. But he was a very nice. I mean, he was very nice about what he was doing. Well, it turns out this guy was wanted by Interpol for piracy, for impersonating people, for check uh, kiting, and a variety of um, forgery, etc., all kinds of stuff. But his his thing was to steal boats, big, I mean, yachts that people weren't kind of paying attention to, and sail them to Colombia, then sell them in Colombia. And they would change all the numbers and everything else like that, repaint it, whatever the case may be. And that's how he made a living. That's called piracy. So when I was in Rhodes, based in Rhodes, I had heard a lot of these piracy stories and specifically um, piracy through government sanction. And as a cruiser, many people were who cruise who've been to a variety of different countries will know that the people that are that are really the scariest are the authorities um they'll come to your boat and they, they can take your boat they'll try to take your boat in a ro- lot of different ways and um i've been through that i've i've had i've had um i've had authorities the police come out literally try to plant drugs on my boat um, I caught them. Um, they couldn't take my boat. I, I've talked to a lot of people, a lot of stories um, about uh, local authorities coming out and making claims um, and and taking the boat and, and put a, putting it on a government mooring and you have to get off the boat and then you have to go and fight in their court to get your boat back. It's crazy. It's a crazy thing. It's enough hassle to get you, you know, not to go cruising in any kind of questionable country. But this is not unusual. I mean, you know, the other area I've sailed in is um, is in the maritime of the Southeast Asia. You know, those are uh, Brunei and Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, East Timor. And this is a crazy place, okay? Because the fishermen in a lot of these places are also pirates. Um, I have I have literally had people uh, come on my boat at night. I had one instance in which I was in the Philippines. And um, I woke up. And I looked and there was a small boy staring at me in my cabin. And it turns out I jumped up. He tried to run away. He tripped. He fell. I mean, this boy wasn't more than eight years old. I grabbed him by the nap of the neck. I took him upstairs. And there his father or uncle or somebody was sitting in um, a little dugout canoe. And they told this kid to come on board and sneak on because he was very small, very good sneaky kid and steal whatever he could steal and then bring it to him i picked him up i threw him overboard into the dinghy and yelled at these guys and they rode away really fast that's piracy but one of the interesting things about that area is there was a lot of development in the trade of slavery there and one of the things that their piracy, especially in Southeast Asia, was the Muslims, as it grew, particularly from uh, Malaysia, um, this would be around between 1770 and 1870, there were about two to 300,000 people enslaved, and they were mostly Christians. Um, they were... They were enslaved by what we would know as the Moro people in Malaysia. And there's some argument about the fact that they, there may have been at least two million slaves captured um, in the first two centuries of uh, Spanish rule in the Philippines. Now, the Moro pirates were, they were called pirates, they were labeled pirates because of their actions. But they really were a people 
that this is what their job was. Their job was pirating, okay? Their job was this sort of thing. And they were very ruthless. They treated people very poorly. If you were a slave and you were captured, you were treated very poorly, um, almost to the point of, of being of dying. Um, uh, they did not treat women very poorly, even though that they did. There was no very few cases of of uh, rape and 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 violence to women. To discipline women, they would just not feed them, and which is an interesting concept. Um, but they were very, very well, res- women, they respected women in a, in, in this strange way this is a very Muslim kind of concept about women. And, and, and yet the men, they treated like dogs. So it was the Spanish in the Philippines in like 1565, um, and then all the way to the 1870s that fought these, these pirates. Um, in fact, there was a famous, um, battle in 1848 between the Spanish warships and and the Moro pirates. I mean, these guys were some serious dudes. I mean, they had a serious navy. So the thing is, is to just to, in terms of its history, and, and there still are, look, there still are pirates in, in this area, um, and, and quite famous. But they can be a pirate one day and a fisherman the next day. They could be a, a, a merchant sailor one day and a pirate the next day um there's a sort of fluidity that is between these people so i always caution people when they're going through the straits of malacca or or any of that area around malaysia and stuff like that and borneo etc you know uh, the people are very nice in general almost all of them are very nice but they are desperate and that should be your key thing. How desperate are the people I'm around? You know, if you take a million dollar yacht or a couple hundred thousand dollar yacht and you're in an anchorage in a village that hasn't hasn't made all collective a hundred thousand dollars in ten years, you can't sit there on your boat and just think that, oh, this is charming. Look at these nice people. This is very charming. They're gonna want what you have. That's going to work in their head. They're going to see you as an opportunity. And seeing you as an opportunity is something that you can control. You don't have to be an opportunity. You can be less of an opportunity. And when you're sailing around the world and, and, and been in a lot of different ports, making yourself less of an opportunity is one of the most important things you can do to protect yourself from pirates. I made this trip from Rhodes, Greece, uh, down to the port of Syed in Egypt. Now, Egypt's got some desperation, no doubt, but it's also very heavily um, military. And I went through the Suez Canal. Now, how you do that? First of all, you need an agent. And I was lucky enough to have an agent in Greece who had a relationship with an agent in Egypt, which in that part of the world, everybody has relationships. And so I went to the Port of Said. Uh, the agent met me. Um, he said, here's what we're going to do. I paid him the extra fees. There is a possibility you could do it. You could do it on your own. I mean, but this is not the kind of place that you go cheap, all right? You want all the protection you can get. And having an agent who knows the military, who can do your passports, who who can get you in line, who knows the line handlers, who, all this stuff that you need to know that you could go and pay for yourself, right, is too complicated. It's too dangerous, just let it be. Hire yourself an agent. Spend 500 bucks. Easy, schmeasy. Let it be done. Anywhere in the Eastern Med, I didn't do anything without an agent. Simple as that. Turkey, Egypt, Syria. I went to Syria. I was 
I had an agency there that, that looked after me in Syria. It was brilliant. Never, never really worried. Let's put it that way. So the next, the next thing I did was go through the canal itself. And I don't know how many people have ever been through a canal, but the, the Suez is actually, I'm surprisingly wide, to be honest. And the canal itself is surprisingly green. Um, that was my first, that was my first idea of it. Um, it's kind of green. And when you're coming from the Mediterranean and going, there's a highway that runs right beside it. And um, you're just, you're just going, there's shipping, there's people, it's just like this long straight river kind of concept. And it's really beautiful. And it's really kind of unique. And there's lots and lots of things to see as you're going down the river. This is when you're going to see a lot of dowels sailing, which, by the way, um, don't even think p these people know the rules of the road. You're, you've got to be a defensive sailboat driver. And that includes big ships. They will not give you... You just make sure you're out of their way. But in the Suez, it's very organized. Everybody's in line. You got to go. Make sure you have plenty of fuel. Be topped off before in Point Sayed. And make sure you have... Because you're going you're gonna to have to motor really fast through this area. And you're going to use a lot more f fuel than you're used to. So it's kind of a sprint to get through the canal because these big ships, I mean, giant Navy ships go through there. I mean, it's, it's, there's, it's a path, it's a highway and you've, and you've got to keep up, you got to keep up as fast as you can go. Um, that's just it. You can't languish. So, and, and you can't, you can't depend on the wind either. Um, you know, sometimes it works in your favor and you can get a really great sail out of it. Um, but sometimes it, it's just, there's no wind. You got to take the sails down and it shifts quite a bit. So once you're down through the Suez, all right, you're, you're into the Gulf of Suez. Now from the Gulf of Suez, we, we went down to, um, Urgata. Now Urgata is a big zone of hotels, uh, beaches, um, tremendous diving um just just it's a tremendous place it's should be on someone's bucket list to go down there because the coral is fantastic it's some of the best i've ever seen in the world and i've been all over the caribbean for coral and i've been out to australia and i've i've done done a lot of diving and and snorkeling and all the rest but um yeah egypt's got some coral that's amazing and dolphins and the sea life is just it's just a wonderful Urgata is a wonderful wonderful place a bit crazy on land um have to be of course a little bit careful there's you know there's there's been uh terrorists um in Urgata itself in hotels some people have been kidnapped buses have been attacked but for the most part you're pretty safe on the water in this area um, the Egyptian Coast Guard is, is uh, um, pretty attentive, and um, you're in good shape. So I got this idea when I was in Urgata which are, you know, beautiful islands and, and, and lots of dive places and stuff to sail up the Gulf of Aquaba. Now, the Gulf of Aquaba is kind of a weird um, place because at the very end of it is a town, a city called Ilat, which is Israeli. Um, you have Jordan to the right. You've got Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting place. A lot itself is is super crazy um lots of gunboats and and very militarized and you know it's like teenagers you know with guns kind of concept on boats etc um 
But in generally, it was a fairly warm... After I got past the authorities, um, they wouldn't let me on my boat for... Let me off my boat for a while. But, uh, you know, we got through it. We, we paid the fees, which is always what it ends up being, pay the fees. Um, Jordan was... We had stopped in Jordan a couple of times and never had a problem. They didn't even ask for my passport. They did. They're just like, hey, how you doing? What's happening? You know, American. Oh, we love you. Blah blah blah. And 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 that was sort of the general concept. And it was fun. It was like really kind of interesting. And I had done this in the winter, so the winter can be warm some days, and then sometimes it can be very. Uh, it can get cold. Um, it can get cold in such a way, the water's always warm, but it can get cold in such a way where you get these fronts that move in and the sand just picks up off the desert and just, you get nothing but sand on your boat. And in fact, I had wooden masts on my CT-54 and, and the varnish on those masts was just about taken off one night um, on one side of the mast from a, a sandstorm that blew through and um, there was sand everywhere I mean there was I had everything locked down um, you know ports closed doors you know everything shut up and everything and we had this this thing I mean I actually found sand under my pillow it was it's amazing how it gets everywhere so anyway back to the whole idea of the pirate um, I decided um to go to Kenya. I thought since I was in this part of the world and I had you know it's not a part of the world that I would go to very often or most people wouldn't but I just wanted to take the advantage. I had the time, I had the money and I had the boat to do all of this. So um that's exactly what I did. Um I I sailed down and um, through the Red Sea, I stopped uh, in uh, Jeddah, uh, which was very, very lovely, um, very sweet place. Realized that a lot of the Red Sea, there's not a lot of services in the Red Sea for boats. So you have to be really careful um, about how you uh, keep food and fuel. I made it down. I went to the uh, Farasan uh, Island Marina Sanctuary, which was very lo- lovely. I picked up some fuel there. It's, it's just just some gorgeous. Again, the diving is incredible. And and just as a small side note, um, I think every boat should have or your boat, you should, you should probably take a dive class, get certified, get yourself a, get yourself a tank, you know, get yourself everything you need to go diving and put it on your boat. You may not want to use it a lot, but make sure it's on your boat because you never, never know when say, for example, you have to go under your boat to untangle some fishing line or, or, or something like that. I had to actually do that in the Red Sea. I had to actually go underneath the boat because I had picked up one of those big, thick nylon um, uh, nets, and it was all around my prop. And I had to sit, I had to dive on that to go and cut that away from the prop. Um, it just, it just got wound up. I, it was a piece of stray. It was a piece of stray fishing net. That's all. And but I'm glad I had the dive, and I dive. I was a master diver, um, still am. Love diving, and this was. It's always a great treat to do this, especially in an area where it's really beautiful. But as something equipment that you need to have on your boat, I think that's a really key thing to have on your boat if you're going to do any kind of cruising, because um, you never, never, never know. So I had to go down and stay away from um, Eritrea. Um, because they were having a civil war over there. And one of the things you realize when you're sailing, especially in this part of the world, is uniforms are kind of optional things. Um, You really don't know who is actually 
somebody in charge, you know, who has authority and who isn't in authority. Um, there is a lot of uh, nonsense that goes on. My advice, and in this case, I had stayed, you know, closer to Yemen because at the time Yemen was not in a war, which it is today, but I had stayed closer to Yemen um, as a rule because Eritrea was going through a very vicious civil war. So you come down to the very, very end of the Red Sea and Parim Island is sticking out from Yemen. And it's, it's all, it's very close. On the other side is Somalia. And uh, so we went around and I forget the name of the town um, and I probably will say it wrong. Al Badahana, um, and I fueled there before I made the super run. Um, I made the run across to Djibouti. Um, Djibouti is an interesting place, and I mean, I'm, I have a bucket list of places that I wanted to see and I wanted to do. So Djibouti is kind of the last little place that you can go and feel relatively safe before you hit into Somalia. <clears throat> you know, the, the wilds of Somalia, I should say. And um, I got fuel, I got fuel, our food. But one of the key things that I found there is is I'm very paranoid in a degree of, of who's watching me. Who is suddenly my friend? Who's coming up and saying, hey, where are you going next? Where are you going to do this? There are networks of people that can get that get paid for tipping off the actual pirates to where you're going to be and how you're going to sail. Okay. Um, I always told them the opposite. I said, Oh, I'm going back to Yemen. That's all. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going back to Yemen. Right. And they kind of were like, okay, whatever. You sure you're going to, yeah, that's where I'm going. So I kind of lied to a lot of these people in order to throw them off the scent. I went out, and I would be, this was the beginning of not seeing land, so to speak. You have to get far enough off land that, that, that far enough off the land so they can't see you from Djibouti. So that's about six miles or so. And then I would, I would make, you know, a hard turn and I would start heading south, you know, south, southeast. Um, and I would start heading down to get out of the, out of the uh, out of the Gulf, this is the Gulf of Aden, and um, you kind of run around the Gulf of Aden, and there's a couple of islands at the end of Gulf of Aden. You can stay in the middle pretty much and not be seen, but there are a lot of boats. There's a lot of fishing boats. These guys have these skiffs. Um, they've got themselves a big you know, 60, 80, 90 horsepower um, outboard on them. And um, they don't mind being uncomfortable at all. And I mean, there's some, there's some rough places. So during this time, it was not necessarily, it was just the beginning of the height of, of the open piracy that we had seen from, uh, you know, Captain Phillips. And, and that and there's still at that time these people who were fishermen they had they had a they had a real issue um, and the issue was that commercial giant commercial fishing enterprises um, the Japanese the Chinese would come by and suck all the fish out of the sea and for the local fishermen, this was this was devastating, and this because they weren't they weren't uh, disposed to be pirates. These were proud people. They're they're honest people, right? They they but with all the fish gone, they were fishermen without fish. So what do they do? They do the next thing that they can do. They they can't farm. They can't. You know, that stuff's out of the question. So what they do is they organize themselves into efficient pirate and piracy um, consortiums. Um, it's not, it's just not 
two or three guys in a boat that are robbing a boat um, is a consortium that's involved with the boat and the, all the rest of the stuff that goes with it. It's a very, it's a very well organized, thought through bank accounts, the whole shoot and match. So the best thing to do is, first of all, tell everybody you know where you're going. They will all say to you, are you nuts? And you will say, yeah, I'm kind of nuts. Yeah, okay, yeah, I get that part. But in any case, there's a very, very tiny island. Um, And I actually have to look it up. It's called Socotra. And it's it's actually named after Socrates. Um, and you think that you could kind of shoot between the Gulf of Aden and these islands out there. Um, not a good idea. You have to stay as much as the center in the Gulf of Aden until you get a few hundred miles out um, into the Arabian Sea. And then calculating make a very very strong south southing and and keep on going um you'll almost feel like you're heading to the seychelles at this point um but it's sort of best to stay you know 100 200 miles off um the coast of somalia and um go fast um I had a couple of boats come out um, to take a peek at, at our boat. Um, I, I had great sailing weather. I had one, maybe one of the best uh, weeks of sailing that I've ever had in my life was sailing um, along the coast of, of Somalia. And um, I had plenty of fuel. I knew exactly you know what my fuel limits were. And I was headed to Kenya. I was actually headed to uh, Mombasa, and um, I was just flat out as fast as I could go. And the thing that I had an advantage of is is that I had wood mass, and I took down my radar reflector. I didn't want to be picked up on radar. I did have a radar, which I would turn on on occasion just to check around to see where I was at. But my radar, based on what it was, was sort of was only good to about maybe 12, 15 miles the most, depending on the swell I was on. Um, So I would switch it on real fast, you know, take a quick peek to see if anybody was around me or following me or anybody was in front waiting for me. And I did actually find a couple of boats that were ahead on my course by about five miles. And I changed my course to give them plenty of berth. And so I, I changed my course and kept my eye on them and literally went around them uh, like by a distance of five miles and then back down on my course after I had passed them. It turns out that I think what they were, were just they were just fishermen. They were out running lines and that's what that's what they were but i did my best to get out because boy they see that big old white sail out there oh that's money 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 and piracy is about desperate people and that's what it's about that's where everybody that's how they get to be pirates okay and if you look at you know they start on the desperation then they become pirates like the caribbean was filled with with out of work um sailors you know the 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 stewards finished or took the stewards took back over the 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 england and then all the people in england you know there was no war between france and 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 england so all these uh people that were well-trained sailors um were put ashore they had no jobs so they were desperate for for jobs, desperate for work, and and that's how they took up on these on these uh, ships, and they and and they became quote unquote pirates, and and the whole idea is that they were desperate. In Southeast Asia, in East Asia, um, pirates and slavery were uh, a government institution, but the people committing these acts were very poor people who had sailing skills 
and all sailors this is kind of your this is this is where you go you know back in the day today we we wouldn't do this okay but at the time especially in the 17th and 18th century and of course in the 19th century the british who were the naval power at the time um put it just said no more piracy period if we catch you as a pirate we're going to judge you we're going to hang you and that is it there's no questions asked you're a pirate you're dead they had they made that an obligation and that finality really kind of started with i guess it's sir francis drake i mean world traveler um you know, they almost hung him for piracy. Uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, another person. And I I bring Sir Walter Raleigh up because he was actually hung um, for attacking a Spanish town and laying waste to it, which was an act of, being, of piracy because it broke a treaty between Spain and England, and he was made a, um, an example of. But Sir Walter Raleigh wrote some things that I found to be quite interesting, and um, one of which is a poem that sort of articulates the nature of of the being, of uh, the, the social sensibility. And, and it's a social sensibility in the way people... The, the way people uh, saw the world. And the poem is called The Lie. Tell zeal it wants devotion. Tell love it is but lust. Tell time it met but motion. Tell flesh it is but dust. And wish them not reply, for thou must give the lie. Raleigh was right. William Carlos Williams wrote, who is a 20th century poet, wrote, Raleigh was right. And he said, Not now, love itself a flower, with roots in parched ground, empty pockets, make empty heads. Cure it, if you can, but do not believe that we can live today in the country, for the country will bring us no peace. What these two poems are about and referring to is the nihilism and the desperation that is underlying all social cultures, all the cultures. And especially, this was a very uh, big topic when you ask, how does somebody go from being a fine, upstanding human being um, to being a vicious, uh, murderous pirate. Well, it's because they saw nothing else in their horizon. It really wasn't until it really wasn't until the 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 Reformation or um, more Romanticism came into the population. It wasn't, uh, it went across the board from Asians um, and Indians um, to the Middle East, to the Caribbean, um, to the Mediterranean. Uh, there was, in a sense, nothing to live for. So you did what you had to do to exist. And this is what Raleigh was talking about. And Raleigh was eventually, essentially, executed, hung, for being a pirate. So this is the sort of understanding of piracy that I'm trying to get across. So I carefully made my way around Somalia. I made my way down into Kenya, and that was a really worthwhile trip. I had strongly considered to keep going down to Madagascar, but uh, that wasn't in the cards. I had I had work that I had to to do back in um, in Greece and Turkey, and so I had to make the reverse of the trip. Now, 
that went as well. Um, the sailing was good. One of the parts of that world when you when you come out of the Red Sea is is literally you could be on your rubber ducky and literally float from the Red Sea over to um, India. Um, the current and the wind will carry you. It tr trades. But then when the monsoon changes, um, you're pretty well screwed. Um, but you can get from India back up into the Red Sea in a breeze. Um, it's one of the few places that I know of in the world that, that you have that kind of reverse uh, wind and current operating. Um, and it's the reason why if you go to the southern part of India, and I had discussed this um, in previous episodes, and um, you go to Kerala, where's the peppers, you'll find they have sites there, archaeological sites, which go back to Phoenician times. And Greek, Roman, um, early Christianity, lots of stuff there. Very interesting. Um, but it's all because of the, the current and the wind and the monsoon and how they reverse. So I did catch part of the monsoon coming back up. Um, it made for some rough sailing, um, but fast sailing. And that's kind of the only thing that I wanted to do is just when you're going around Somalia, which is, you know, it's not like there's pirates every 10 miles, okay? There's, there are pirates, there are people. Um, stay off the coast, go fast, don't have too much um, profile, right? Don't tell people where you're going. You know, keep it, keep it in-house. Even the authorities. Um, I told the authorities in Kenya I was going to Madagascar. I mean, who cares? Maybe they were on the payroll of some pirate organization or something. I just, I said, no, I'm going that direction. Okay, great. Boom, I'm gone. I went the opposite direction. I do that all the time. So we sailed all the way back up, all the way up the Gulf of Suez, back through the canal again, out the, the end of the Port Said and back into the Mediterranean. And I can't tell you how relieved I was to get back in the Mediterranean in terms of safety. Um, even though I, I had to sail off the coast of Israel, Syria, to get back up, sail around Turkey, um, and get back into, um, into Greek waters. And that was kind of a crazy thing. But this brings up a couple of issues which I really want to cover kind of quickly. Um, the defense of having guns on board. Now, some of you know that I did. I served in Vietnam, um, saw quite a bit of action at the time, and um, I'm quite familiar with how to handle weapons. Um, tactically, being on a slow boat with a weapon, you're a sitting duck. No matter, you could scare people away with your weapon. Uh, it might even seem like it's going to work. But in terms of cruising, having a weapon on board is a, the biggest pain in the ass in the world. Because in other countries, you have their laws. It's not an American law. I mean, in America, everybody loves to carry the weapons around, you know. But hey, um, any other country, they're just going to confiscate your gun and you'll probably never see it again. So that whole kind of machismo, you know, I can protect myself... Unless you have a freaking cannon on board or a 20 millimeter Gatling gun, um, you know, it's not going to help you. Honestly, you're just going to escalate. Your job, and this is the problem that a lot of people have, is they want to show everybody that they're capable of escalation when in fact they're not capable of escalation because tactically it's a stupid thing to do. Learn to de-escalate. Keep a low profile, all right? Just don't tell people where you're going. Don't put your cards out on the table. Be humble. Be poor. Be nice. Keep it going in that regard, okay? Um, because most private sailing yachts are not worth the effort of a pirate, to be honest. And um, so just, you know, keep it that way and keep going. 
The other thing about, and that's my thing on guns. Um, I talk later, later episodes on guns. Um, fiberglass does not stop bullets very well, my friends. Um, the other thing is, is the, that I haven't talked about is the letter of marquee and the letter of marquee literally took, um, ships that were warships and privatized them and, but gave them the legal, um, that gave them the legal, uh, accordance to, uh, creating piracy and the French, attacked the English, the English attacked the French, both of them attacked the Spanish, and really the whole reason everybody attacked the Spanish was because the Spanish had all the gold. They were they were shipping gold from um, the New World, from Colombia, from Jamaica, Colombia, or not from Jamaica, but from uh, Colombia and Cuba, and they would sail up the Florida coast and the, the Gulf Stream make the right and sail past Bermuda and head straight over to, to Spain in a, in a, in a perfect circular motion. And, um, we're, I'll deal with more about the pirates and about the ships that sort of chase them down. Um, my, my show that I did about the Bermuda sloop, um, which was a very, very fast boat and could point to the wind very well. Kind of what we have today is a normal kind of, um, Marconi rigged, uh, vessel, uh, you know, th those were designed and built furiously to intercept uh, merchantmen. And in most cases, they went from Spanish to merchantmen. And that's what they were all doing. I'm also going to talk a little bit more about pirates um, and slavery. Um, during certain periods of history, uh, the main thing you have to understand is that labor was cheap. Getting labor required people to be to be captured and put in chains to do the labor, the labor in the fields. This is this is the whole point of what slavery was about, because the mechanical revolution hadn't really taken hold. I mean, if you think about it, the the once uh, the cotton mill came out and you could get the seeds out of out of cotton, once you could pick cotton with machinery, um, the whole need for having slavery economically was uh, wasn't needed. So these things, this is something that existed um, because there wasn't a mechanical revolution to replace the actual physical labor that people had to do in order to do to to get. Uh, food and and other things um, out and to create trade. I mean, mining, for example, is often overlooked, but millions of people were put into mines as slaves to mine because it was a way to get the job done on scale and just cheap. Didn't have to feed them that much. And if they died, you got somebody else in there until mining machinery developed and pretty much you had to have professional miners at that point who knew how to operate the machinery, who knew how to run these things. And then the whole slave concept sort of disappeared. So mechanical stuff sort of replaced that. And the same goes for sailing. Sailing took in the age of sail three, 400 men on a ship to sail the ship. And that was not only to sail the ship, but to fight the ship, to fight it on both sides, port and starboard. To You needed five or six men on one gun to fire one cannonball every three or four minutes. And that would be considered fast. And, and, and it took a tremendous amount of effort in order to get the cannon in and out. All the while, someone's shooting at you. When... Cannon was more automatic when you could fire rapidly, like in today's weapons. I mean, if you look at a, a, a thirty was a thirty-three millimeter cannon, okay, that that can that can fire ten thousand rounds a minute. Um, you could chew up an age of sail boat in about 
one minute, two minutes, and there would be nobody left alive. So that's that's kind of where that whole idea is. Being shot at by a Somali in a in a boat with an AK-47, it's going to screw you up, seriously. So it's not something you want to do. So the litter of Marquis is is was uh, done away with um, in the early 19th century. Um, very few were uh, issued at that point. And basically, it's mercenaries. They just created mercenaries. But we, we'll kind of get into that. I'm going to talk more about the age of sail and, and how the age of sail has um, affected and created um, uh, sailing, cruising, and navigating and, and what platforms of war are all about. But there is one thing I wanted to, to, to say is because I have been sort of focusing on, you know, the, 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 the Moro people the, in, in Southeast Asia and in Malaysia. I was talking about um, uh, the Somali pirates, uh, the pirates in the Mediterranean, um, you know, uh, the Muslim pirates, the Barbary pirates. I've talked about the Caribbean pirates. And it's all very exotic. It's all very interesting. But the one thing that kind of gets me excited is a pirate that came from Michigan. A guy named Dan Seavey. There's a whiskey named after Dan called Roaring Dan Seavey. He operated a schooner in Lake Superior called the Wanderer, and he would sail into ports at night, steal cargo from other vessels and warehouses. He also kidnapped and transported women for the illegal prostitution trade. And it was, you know, he did sex trafficking and human trafficking. Um, he did a kind of version of, uh, of poaching. poaching. He, would, he would go to um, fisheries and and, and poach the ship. He would attack one of the ships um, with a cannon, and he killed everybody on board. He was a notorious Great Lakes pirate. There's pictures of him, which I can probably post. Um, eventually, he, he became um, a United States Revenue Cutter captain. Um, he completely switched over, but nobody really kind of knew whether he was still a pirate or... He worked for the government. And it, it's a perfect articulation of what I'm talking about. I mean, the guy was literally arrested in 1908. Um, he turned around and um, he joined the Marshal Service. Somehow, I don't know how he, he managed to do that. They, they brought him in because he was such an expert on, on thievery and, and robbing people. Um, and, and, and he ended up going back to uh, uh, being a, a, a pirate and a smuggler. Um, and later he, he, he actually ended up passing away in like 1949 at the age of 84. And he lives in, um, he was buried in Wisconsin. Um, this is to me like, this is the whole thing. The guy was poor, he managed, got a boat, and he started all this illegal stuff on the boat. Okay, doesn't say very much about his moral character, but then there's the confluence or the confusion between being a pirate, quote unquote, and being a part of the Revenue Cutter Service, okay, as a special agent, um, just like a, a pirate would be, have a letter of marquee um, where they they were uh, ordained by the government to go ahead and 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 do this piracy. Um, or desperate guy in a in a, a boat, a part of a, a larger uh, organization off the coast of Somalia to to capture uh, uh, boats and then sell them um, or ransom them off. Um, the whole idea of piracy piracy hasn't changed in thousands of years. Um, it exists. It probably will continue to exist as long as there are desperate people um, and desperate people who actually can sail. Um, 
or drive or whatever you want to call it. But piracy exists. Now, one of the things that I find fascinating, and especially about the American Mariner, is the whole idea of piracy. Just like this guy, Mr. CV, all right? Interesting guy, um, probably a murderer, vicious. But now there's a whiskey after him, named after him, Roaring Dan CV Whiskey. When you think about how we've elevated this low life into this sort of iconic, lovable rogue stature, it's a very fascinating thing. Captain Morgan's another perfect Captain Morgan's rum. Okay, he was another guy. Letter of Marquis. He worked. He fought. He fought for the English against the Spanish. Okay, but he was he was a pirate. You know. Sir Walter Raleigh, same thing. He f he fought the Spanish. Unfortunately, he picked a time when there was a treaty to destroy a city and take all the loot. Uh, that was a big problem. Robert Sears, who was the gentleman pirate, um, he attacked and, and devastated St. Augustine, the first city in America, okay, which caused the Spanish to build a giant fort there. To protect and they fought off the French and they fought off the English and they fought off a lot of people so you know and Sears did this as a letter of marquee but then turned around and was a pirate and he robbed other places just like Edward Treach did and and all the pirates that we know of um, who were captured they 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 lived in this sort of world of 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 legal illegality they were in the middle of this gray area and it just so happened that a lot of these guys were very egotistic self-centered vicious criminals and they took over and fear ran the whole show and this is how this whole concept of pirates same thing applies to the moro people the guys who ran those things uh those syndicates and they still, there are still syndicates of piracy that goes on. Um, they are often once a year, or twice a year, you always hear of some sort of amazing uh, mega yacht that had been taken over by pirates or people kidnapped or people killed or whatever the case may be. So piracy is alive and it's very interesting. But just to sum up, um, the best way to avoid being a victim of piracy is is not to show your profile too much is to be careful don't share your business too much and um, just sort of stay off their the, the pirates radar that's the best way to do it and keep your antenna up to be safe and um, keeping a low profile and avoiding it is your best um, is your best uh, option for being protected so anyway i'm going to thank you all for listening um it's a lot of fun there's so much to go on um about piracy and um the character of piracy and how the character of a pirate has found its way into the concept of the american mariner and the american character you know the the lovable rogue off on the edge of of society um it's it's we're going to examine more of this so anyway thank you very much for listening thanks for sharing scott that was great so what do we have planned for next week's episode next week we're going to talk about the ricci it's in italy at the bottom of the Gulf of La Spezia. It's a very famous place. Um, most people know about the Cinque Terre and the beautiful towns that are up on the cliff edges above the, the Tyrrhenian Ocean or Tyrrhenian Sea. Um, but uh, La Spezia is just off on the other side of the bay, and it's a very interesting town uh, for boat building. And it has a very interesting cultural meaning. This is where Percy Shelley, 
the famous romantic poet from England, had drowned. And he drowned because he had a sail made, a Genoa made for his little boat, and got caught in a storm and the, the boat capsized. And even his wife said the sail was way too big for his little boat. And um, he drowned. So I'll be talking about uh, I'll be talking about the boat building and about the little town of the Lychee and what it's like to uh, to live in a foreign country for a couple of years. Thank you for tuning in. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, be sure to rate and review. You can find us on Facebook and at offshoreexplorer.org. You can also listen to past episodes at offshore-explorer.simplecast.com. Our theme song is sung by Paulette McWilliams, with additional music by Amanu Itomi and Tommy Twain. Until next time, fair winds and calm seas.